Thank you. <laughs> Today, I'm here to remind us we all have a powerful knife in our pocket. Yes, you heard me very well. A knife. <laughs> and let's be clear, whatever you're going to do with this knife once out of this room is out of my hand, OK? This knife has actually a very familiar name. Can you guess? Empathy. And now I want to tell you how these empathy knives are made and why. Let me see. I can see and perceive already quite some enthusiasm coming through, but still uh -huh, a little bit of skepticism as well. And yes, I believe that these very common, although slightly polarized reactions, are the results of the way empathy has been portrayed so far and the beliefs that we build. With the worst of all, is the belief, with the belief that some people have empathy and others not. It's like saying some people can learn math and others not. I don't think we should accept these statements any longer. Everyone has empathy. It's not true that some people have empathy and others not. With very few exceptions, we are all born with two legs, two hands, two eyes, and with the ability to share and feel the emotional state of other individuals. We all can. Even rats, fruit flies, fish can perceive the emotional state of others. A rat, together with another in distress, will soon become distressed itself. And even more so if he had experienced a similar distress in the past. And now, if I place this rat together with a relaxed one, it will calm down. How is it possible that the emotions of others come to me? Well, I can see, well, not very well now, but I can see you're smiling, frowning, moving faster than usual. I can touch you. Are your muscles tense or relaxed? I can hear you laughing, screaming, crying. I can even smell you. Are you smelling sourly distressed now? Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I am. We and other animals use all our senses to perceive the emotional state of other individuals. And then, a little bit like Sherlock Holmes, our brain gathers and integrates all these informations by activating specific cells and brain circuits. And most importantly, some of these circuits are also active when we feel and we are in a similar state. Through this system, we basically come to feel what the other feels. And this is what we call affective empathy. Many of us, when speaking about empathy, immediately think of pain or negative emotions. But we can share joy, enthusiasm, fatigue. I love ice skating. And I go practicing three to four times per week. And nevertheless, there is this particular evening where the weather is really bad. I had a heavy day at work, and I cannot find the strength to drag me out of my couch. So what do I do? I take my phone, I open it, start YouTube, and I watch one of the videos of my favorite skaters. And then, suddenly, my muscles start twitching, and the enthusiasm of the skater starts spilling into me to the point that I find finally myself going to enjoy the class. Empathy is therefore not just about pain. It's not even just about emotions. We can share the actions and sensations of others too. And this is again because the brain regions that are active, for instance, when I skate, they become active again when I see you skate. How 
Are we always aware that this sharing is happening? <laughs> Not necessarily. The action, sensations, and emotions of other people can spontaneously simply move us or infect us, a little bit like a virus can do. And why did we evolve to let the emotions of others affect us? And how come other species have this ability too? Think about it. In order to survive, we need to gather information from the environment we are in. Is it safe to walk in this neighborhood? Can I find food over there? And what source of information can be any better and any more informative than the behavior and the emotional state of others? Seeing you bend forward, with your arms around your stomach, your face contracted, and emitting this whiny noising with a hot dog on the floor, might suggest I better buy my hot dog somewhere else. And similarly, perceiving whether the lion in front of me is relaxed or hungry can make the difference between life and death. Evolution gifted humans with language. And many believe that our communication mainly relies on language. And it's true, language is a very powerful tool, otherwise I would not even be here, right? But it's not the only tool. Empathy is also another very powerful communication tool. One that might save us from the lion. I mean, you can always try to talk to the lion. One that does not need words. The best friend of my daughter, Julia, lives about 14 hours driving away from home. Every time we meet and the time of departure approaches, a silent, uncontrollable flow of salty water runs down their embrace. The first time, I had the honor to witness such a goodbye. My heart broke and tears wet my cheeks. I didn't need to cry. I was not the one saying goodbye to my best friend. And nevertheless, I did cry. The strength of their emotion was so powerful to literally infect me. Sharing their emotion allowed me for this brief moment to directly feel what their friendship meant to them. There was no need to talk, no need to think. I just felt the love between them as being part of it. And now, of course, I know I need to bring them together again without even the need for them to ask, as I know that I need to buy my sandwich somewhere else. We don't always need words to communicate. At the same time, if I see you on your doorstep crying, how do I know that it's because you were hurt or because your biggest dream came true? Most likely, if I'm just back from my trip with Julia, I will think you feel alone. And this is because our brain uses our past and previous experiences to interpret the behavior and the emotional states of others. So yes, this is a very egocentric way to perceive others. And how much empathy I will feel for you also depends by how similar you and me and the situ situation we are in are. And this is also why we make mistakes sometimes. And this is also why we build social habits and culture that strengthen these similarities. And they, they also um, help emotional sharing by synchronizing brain activity, heart rate, respiration, movements, we sing, we dance, we eat, we watch movies, we play football together. And by doing so, we strengthen our group belongings. And we train our empathy for the people within this group. The biggest drawback of these empathy enhancers activities is that they can also build walls and outgroups. Are you not smiling when I do? 
Aren't you nodding the same way I do? Aren't you using chopsticks to eat, as I do? Well, then you're not like me. You, you don't feel like me. You don't resonate with me, and I don't resonate with you. It would be easier for me to simply ignore you, or even accept to bomb your city. And let's be honest, even if you and me were very similar, do I really want to feel all your feelings all the, way, all the day long? I, I don't think so. Think of an evening you're mourning for the loss of a good friend of yours. Do you really want the anger of the couple fighting next door to affect you? I wouldn't. We're already struggling so much with dealing with our own emotions that I don't want to add yours on top all the time and then risk a burnout. Is therefore empathy good or bad? I think this is just the wrong question. Is this knife good or bad? Well, a knife is a tool. Whether you use it to kill or to spread butter on your sandwich, is fully up to you. And nevertheless, it is important to learn how to use it and when to sharpen it. Can we then similarly learn to master our empathy? Yes, we can. Because this very rough tool that was given to us by evolution comes with the tools to sharpen it. Humans developed another important uh, brain system, the cognitive system, which help us integrate acquired knowledge with our own emotional state, and importantly, also help us to regulate it and control it. As we switch on the light when we come back home in the evening, or we dim it down for a romantic dinner, we can switch on and off our empathy, and we can regulate it. If I now tell you, or even better, if you decide now to feel with the person sitting beside you, I know that your empathy-related brain activity will activate, but it will not if you decide to ignore that person. Consciously and voluntarily, I can use YouTube to overcome my laziness and enjoy my skating class. Consciously and voluntarily, I can decide to switch off my empathy, to concentrate and focus on my own goals. If, as a doctor, I need to amputate the leg of a soldier, I must and can downregulate my empathy for pain, else I will never be able to cut that leg. And now, if I decide not to eat meat anymore, to save the world and the animals, feeling with the animal sufferance at the slaughterhouse will definitely help. As knives are made of different shapes and materials, how much we activate these empathy circuits and how well we can regulate them differs across individuals, as we are not all equally good at playing football despite all of us being able to kick a ball. Some years ago, we showed psychopathic individuals videos of other, another person getting hurt. And then, as expected by the belief that some people have empathy and others not, their brain activity, empathy-related brain activity, did not activate. But then, then we ask them to put themselves in the shoes of the other person, to feel with the victim. And then their brain activity completely normalized. They too could switch on their empathy if they needed to. Your knife might therefore be different from that of your neighbor. If you're born with a butter knife, you know that to cut through your three centimeter steak, you need to take a lot of time sharpening it, right? But the fact that you need this extra, extra time, it should not be an excuse to give up, especially if you want to enjoy your steak. We built a whole school system 
to teach people how to read and write. We don't accept that some people cannot read and write. And this is based on the assumption that everyone can learn to read and write. Similarly, our social life offers plenty of, op of opportunities to train our empathic skills. The problem is that by believing that some people have empathy and others not, we just miss out many of these opportunities. Do you want to train your empathy? You can start anytime, even from your couch. Just play your favorite movie, and now start to feel, and try to feel as much as possible with the emotions of the characters. That's the easy part. Now you watch it again, and try to detach. And now you need to reflect how this change makes you feel, and then do it again. Are you together with other friends? Well, before reacting to their emotional state straight away, or before making this joke about what they eat for breakfast, stop one second and try to feel what they're feeling or what you would feel in their stead. And just do this over and over until you develop good habits. Why is it important to train our empathic skills? Well, as refining your language and cutting skills can help you reach your goal in a more, in a more effective way, research shows that by training your empathic skills, you will become a much, a much more balanced and successful social individual. If a mom cannot avoid feeling pain every time her little daughter scratches her knee, she will never find the strength to let her fall over and over and over again. She will become an overprotective mother with an anxious child. Ignoring her pain will make her feel unloved and uncared for. Let your empathy help you feel she is in pain, but then keep this pain out enough for you to find the strength to let her fall again. We all share the responsibility to train our empathy, to become better managers, better doctors, better teachers who can feel understand, and at the same time, act. To the skeptics, I thought of the analogy with a knife, mainly for you. I thought that by picturing empathy as something we can touch, use, and master every day, it will be easier for you to accept that empathy, too, is a tool we can learn to master, whether you knew you had it or not. And to, and to the believers, if picturing empathy as a knife takes the magic away, well, then think of it as a magic wand that too can, bring, can be used to bring peace and war. Let me conclude with one last anecdote. It's kind of funny that it took me years of research to come to the very same conclusion that Julia knew when she was six. I remember this afternoon in which I was telling her off because I thought she was treating her schoolmate in a way that was not really appropriate. So I asked her, Julia, where is your empathy? And then she stopped, looked at me. Mommy, don't worry. It's here in my heart. I can use it when I need it. Thank you.